Okay. Um, yeah. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Miriam, and I'm the curatorial assistant um, in the visual arts team at Willoughby City Council. Uh, and we run Art Space on the Concourse and the Incinerator Art Space, um, which just reopened this week, actually. Uh, I'm here today with local artist Kathy Shug, uh, who will discuss her processes and the inspiration behind the artworks for her solo exhibition, uh, Light Coloured Joy, uh, which is currently on at the Incinerator Art Space. Uh, this exhibition is a reflection on places and circumstances in which she has uh, experienced, shared or observed moments of joy. Uh, inspired by her travels and encounters across six continents, uh, Kathy's work is a window into her fascination with landscape and the natural world and how people shape their lives within it. Uh, her exhibition, uh, it opened this week uh, and it will run until Sunday the 7th of November. So if you're able, I strongly recommend you pay a visit to Kathy's show so that you can see her work in person. Um, if you aren't able to, then um, hopefully uh, today we'll uh, give you a little taste um, and provide a bit of insight into her work. Thanks very much, Miriam. It's nice to be here. And, and hello, all those lovely people out there. Um, so um, just before we get started, um, there's just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, today's talk will be recorded um, and later uploaded to our website. Uh, we will send you a link to this recording in a follow-up email after the presentation. Um, you will also have noticed that I've put all of you on mute, uh, but we do welcome you to leave comments and questions in the Zoom chat at any time during the talk. Uh, we will go through these uh, questions um, at the end of the interview um, and we'll endeavor to get to everyone before the end of the session. So yeah, we'll, um, we'll get started with the first image here. Sorry. Okay, so um, one of the artworks, Kathy, that you've included in your exhibition is um, the work you actually made for your HSC. Um, it's called um, Nan's Meadow. Um, could you tell us why you decided to include this particular work? Yeah, it probably seems a little bit weird for an artist practising currently to be putting in something that was painted quite some time ago, a long time ago. But this work for me was just such an important piece in getting me to understand that making art uh, I spent about six months outside on a veranda at school with birds and trees next to me, uh, painting this every moment I could when I didn't have to be in a classroom. And the experience itself was just so beautiful. And also the, the, the being able to reflect upon the subject in an artwork is, is really, really special as well. Uh, so, so for me, it was a, um, a no-brainer to put this in the show. I just had to borrow it from the lovely lady who's had it for all that time, who happens to be Nan. Oh, that's really great. Um, do you think uh, this was the beginning uh, of your interest in the natural environment? What a great question. Um, I've always really been interested in the natural environment. My, my family's a very outdoorsy, active family. So as a child, I spent a lot of time on beaches, uh, and on farms all over um, New South Wales. And for me, um, walking through a paddock was, um, was you know, much more fun than sitting watching uh, TV or anything like that. Um, so I, I think I've always been really interested, but doing this particular work made me reflect so much about what it was that I'd seen and walked through at the time when this photo was created. Uh, which is what I actually worked from for my HSC. And if you look really deeply into it, it's hard when you're looking at a slide, um, that there, there's a little world within a world there. there. There are caterpillars down the bottom, tiny little creatures hiding, lots of different textures. And, and for me, the natural environment's all about that. It's about so many different layers of life. And that's why I find it fascinating. Yeah. Um... You've done quite a few landscapes, actually. Um, this landscape scene here is uh, from Greece. Um, you've travelled quite extensively. Um, could you tell us how your travels have inspired your practice? Thanks, Miriam. It's, it's actually very much a, a two-way interaction. I find that when you're travelling, um, there's so much that's new and you're often looking at things with very fresh eyes and, and with no preconceptions. 
but it's not just a case of, of looking at things. It's also a case of feeling and smelling and tasting and doing all that fabulous stuff that you do when you're, you're travelling anyway. And that, that becomes, in a strange way, part of your artwork, particularly I find when I'm, when I'm painting on site. Um, but, but the other thing that happens also is that your art end up, ends up influencing the way that you travel and the way that you experience travel because making art, particularly on site or, or after a day of doing something, it makes you reflect and connect very much with the environment that you're in, perhaps the people that you're with. Um, so, and it also gives you permission just to sit and really absorb an environment. And so often when we're traveling, we feel that we have to keep moving and stay busy. So arts are a really special thing to do on plan air when you're just sitting quietly. Yeah. I'm sorry. I accidentally skipped a, a slide, <laughs> but, um, yes, this is the next one. Um, but yeah, this painting is stylistically quite different, uh, to the other landscapes, um, that, you know, we've previously shown. Um, do you find that being immersed in a different uh, country and culture impacts your approach uh, to painting? Very much so. It's a case of being inspired by what you see and what you experience in a different country. And, and also, as I said, that, that sort of freshness of the, um, the, the encounter. Uh, the other thing that, that really influences different styles in my work when I'm overseas painting or, or in Australia painting is the circumstances of the travel. Uh, this, this one's very different because I was actually travelling with my kids um, and, and uh, you know, my latest kid um, edition, hello, Gab Martinez, I know you're out there. Um, and uh, we were, we were travelling during the day and experiencing places. We were travelling through Spain, southern Spain and northern Spain. And uh, kids, when they're 20-something years old, don't want to sit there for two hours waiting for mum to finish painting. So we do these activities and I'd, I'd take quick sketches. Um, I'd, I'd uh, do lots and lots of photographs, sometimes write a few notes in a, a little sketchbook in a backpack or a handbag and then keep moving. Uh, so then while the kids went out or were doing what they wanted to do after dinner at night and that sort of thing, I'd sit in an apartment that we were staying in, making sure it had a dining table, and then I'd paint this sort of thing where I was trying to distill the experience and the, the overwhelming sensations of, of travelling and trying to distill sometimes a whole day's impressions into one piece of work. So that changes things very much as well. Uh, it's, it's not... Um, a one-way street it's a two-way street it's it's how you travel um, and how it affects you at the same time but also what's achievable at the time yeah it's really interesting you're talking about um yeah having to do something quickly sketch quickly on the spot you know because of the circumstances um, and actually you paint on plein air um, quite a lot um we have some yeah images here of you um yeah painting on plein air um yeah, could you tell us why you enjoy painting on plein air so much? Yeah, <laughs> shall do. Yeah, the images are a classic. If you look very closely, my uh, two dogs are sitting under my feet in the shadows there on the left-hand one. Um, on, on the right-hand one, I'm actually in the outback. So you've got kind of beach Australia and you've got outback Australia. I love being outside. I absolutely love it. I, I love that connection with landscape and taking time in the landscape and being able to sit and observe. And I find for me that, that working on plein air outdoors in the environment that I'm wanting to paint, I get a, a much greater understanding of where I am, how I'm feeling and, and how that connects with what's happening at the end of my hand, which is, you know, maybe a paintbrush, it, it may be a, a pigment ink pen, it could be crayon, it, it might be something as simple as a, as a graphite pencil if I'm really in a hurry. Um, but it's, it's just that, it's that connection and the immediacy of being in the environment. Uh, it also forces you to work fairly quickly because the light changes on average every 10 minutes. So you will find that in 10 minutes' time, where you thought the shadows were, they're no longer there. Or something that you couldn't see because it was in shadow has something suddenly jumped out to bite you. So it forces me to work very spontaneously and 
just to really go for it, to be brave. Um, I'm, I'm not very good at being precious. When I'm precious, I'm pretty pathetic. Um, my, my paintings and, and drawings get all tight. So I just have to go for it. And, and that's one of the reasons that On Plan Air works. Uh, the other thing is that as a mixed media artist, um, I'll often proceed to work later down the track that's inspired by those pieces. They're by no means all masterpieces. Uh, some of them are total duds, but, but I learn something through the process. And it's not just about the paintings, it's also about the environment that I'm in. Yeah, um, we can actually see in um, that image on the left um, that you've got this uh, red backpack, um, which is filled uh, with all of the equipment that you need um, to paint on plein air. Um, I think we've also got another image of you. Um, yeah, here you are again. Um, and yeah, painting on plein air, it can be uh, quite challenging, uh, but you've come up with some very innovative uh, methods for transporting materials and equipment with you while you create. Um, I actually think we have, um, yeah, some more images here um, of you paint, um, yeah, using that painting kit. Um, could you tell us more uh, about this and maybe share some of the tricks um, or hacks that you picked up uh, while painting on planet? Yeah, I think, I think hacks sometimes is a good word to describe exactly how I go about it. Um, if you wouldn't mind just flipping back to the previous one, um, I can just talk a little about the some of the gear there because I've found over years of working on plein air in various conditions that particularly in Australia or in, in warm conditions, the, the sort of gear that you can see there is really helpful. That's partially to stop me getting sunburned. Uh, but the other thing that it's really useful for, draping a, a sarong over your, your hat, and you can see my terrible old art hat there, it's made of truckies canvas, nothing can kill it. <laughs> um, draping a sarong over you also allows you to shade your paper from the sun. And it's very, very easy to get a glare headache when you're working on white paper in full sun or to find that you're so dazzled you actually can't assess your work properly. So uh, the sarong is really useful for that reason and to, to keep you a little cooler and, um, and as I said, stop you getting sunburned. Um, you can see the very small watercolour kit that I've got there. That's a travelling kit um, and it, it has several slide-out palettes I know that there are some people who can work very, very compactly and not make a mess. I'm a real grub when I paint. So I'll always have a kit like that that has some pull-out palettes on it. Working with watercolour is great because you don't have to take a lot of material though. So for me, that just folds up and it's about the size of, of a wallet. It's, it's just a fabulous little set, beautiful quality watercolours. Um, I absolutely love Windsor and Newton and Daniel Smith watercolours because I find they've got beautiful pigment that's really concentrated and, and it, it goes on well when you're outdoors in a variety of conditions. Um, the other thing that I've got there, there's a, a, a what we call a, a lantern pot. It's a, it's a pop-up plastic water pot. So it's very, very compact, but it can be quite big. And I usually have water in three things. I'll put water into the lantern pot and that's where I clean my brushes. Um, I'll have water in one of the old fashioned kiddies pop-up bottles, little popper top bottles, because that allows me to always have some clean water that I can drop, drop by drop into my palette. That's really useful. Um, I used to use a syringe, but I got too many questions about that from people walking past me. <laughs> <laughs> very awkward um, and the other thing that I always have is a water bottle because if you get really really desperately thirsty um, you don't want to have to drink your dirty painting water so three lots of water um, I usually these days only have a couple of brushes one a, a you know, lovely uh, squirrel brush a beautifully beautifully wire bound, bound squirrel brush that I bought many years ago in France but it's more your Asian style of brush that holds a lot of watercolor comes to a beautiful point um, another small uh, travel brush that, that's really only 10 centimetres long at most, so it's really compact, will fit in a handbag easily. Um, I also, I prefer using watercolour blocks rather than separate pieces of paper, so they're gummed around the sides, and that means I don't have to stretch paper, uh, and it means it won't buckle either. So for me, there's a couple of things there that are really useful. Um, the red backpack, absolute gold. Um, I've been looking for years to find one for other people and I can't. It's actually an artist's backpack. It's got a seat, which you can see in that image doubles as a table. 
Uh, it fits on my back. It, it only weighs a couple of kilos and it's got lots and lots of compartments for all that messy stuff that artists tend to carry around. And uh, so far it's been to five out of the six continents that I've been to and I haven't been able to kill it yet. So it's, it's pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. You just mentioned that, yeah, you've been to like five or six different continents. Um, yeah, you've obviously painted on plein air um, in all of those places. So I'll just, um, yeah, this is an example um, of an image that you made while you were on site in France. Um, could you tell us about the methods uh, you use and what materials um, you find work best for working on plein air? Yeah, okay. Well, some of those we've already discussed. The one that's in front of you there uh, is one of the watercolour blocks. So sometimes I'll do sketches uh, just very, very quickly in a, a small visual diary. Uh, Hanamula diaries I absolutely love because you can get 300 GSM lovely heavy art paper that you can paint or draw on. And with my watercolour blocks, I always try to get very heavy paper too, usually about 300 GSM as well, density. It just makes such a difference to the product, but also it makes it easier. Um, I'll usually have a couple of the watercolour blocks going at once because if you've got wet work on one, you don't want to have to wait until you peel off that top sheet to get to the next one. So that's really important, having a variety of paper that you can just pick up at will. Um, here you've got um, pigment ink on watercolour paper. Uh, I so often start out thinking I'm going to do a quick sketch, but I've learned over time that that's often not what happens. I'll get really involved in a drawing. And as with this one of these beautiful village rooftops in, in Champagne in France, a uh, couple of hours later, you know, I might emerge going, wow, I didn't realise I'd just spent two hours and now I'm hungry. Uh, so it's, it's really important to have a sort of range of materials on hand. And um, the Stadler pigment pens that I use are just fabulous. They'll last for months and they never get a furry tip. Uh, and, and the inks archival as well. So it's, it's not dye as many felt tip pens are, it's actually proper pigment ink. So it's it's fully archival and um, those pieces will last for years. Yeah, um, you also uh, complete uh, some works uh, later on in your studio. Um, this is an example here of two versions of the same landscape uh, scene. Uh, the one on the left um, was painted on plein air um, and the one on the right was painted in the studio. Um, can you explain the difference between creating something on site uh, and creating it later in the studio? Uh, first of all, the studio tends to be less hazardous uh, and th there tend to be fewer accidents in a studio. Um, the, the unexpected is what you can expect when you're working on site. Uh, the image that you've got there on the left-hand side uh, is, um, is, is one of those images that had to be created very quickly because the perfect angle for that uh, particular view, which is a block away from where my new studio is down in Bower or in the Southern Highlands, that perfect view is right in the middle of a street called Shepherd Street, which has cars flying over the hill behind you. So... I had to do very quick sketches there and take lots of photographs from that site and then move myself over and work from those sketches as much as I could. So some of that one's done on plan air, but in the interest of not getting run over but still getting the perfect view, I kind of had to combine both plan air and studio work. Uh, plan air work, you're, you're much more limited with what you can use. Uh, so that one on the left, for example, is watercolour and gouache, two water-based mediums. They're very, very compact and you can carry them easily. Uh, and then the ink is done much, much later in the studio. And uh, when you look at the two of them, the one on the left is actually very small. It's the sort of size that would fit almost into a handbag. Um, it's been done with very quick, broad strokes because in a plein air piece, I'm trying to connect with the landscape and I'm trying to uh, almost rationalise probably, is probably not the right word because my response to a landscape is always very emotional. Um, but, but possibly just, just try to rationalise it to the extent where I'm working out where things are, what I'm interested in leaving in, what attracts my eye. Um, the work that I subsequently do in the studio 
is often based on the plan air works and sometimes it'll be based not just on one but on on 20 or 30 plan air works that i've done on site so it's it's often much more an amalgamation of ideas and and i've got the time to work uh, in, in a much more in-depth way. The one on the right took me about three months to do overall. Uh, so a very different, much more labour intensive, much more layered, uh, considered approach. Uh, it's also a lot bigger. It's um, you know almost as wide as I am tall. So it's not the sort of thing that's easy to handle when you're outdoors. Um, you're more likely to get whacked by a canvas if you're working that big. And um, I like to be fairly mobile too. So my plan air work tends to be much smaller and usually on paper, whereas uh, the world's my oyster when I'm in the studio. It's um, interesting you mentioned um, that, uh, yeah, sometimes you can be a bit more selective with what you choose to represent in like a landscape like this. We've got, um, yeah, closer up image here of um, the, the painting. Um, and this isn't an exact uh, representation of the landscape uh, near your home. Um, you've actually left out um, a number of man-made uh, elements uh, which are part of the skyline. Um, could you tell us why you decided uh, to do this? I'm absolutely fascinated by this environment um, on and off over the last year, a lot more on than off because of COVID and lockdown. I've got to know the landscape around Barrel where, where my studio is so well. And it changes a lot through the seasons. Through the seasons, particularly with so many deciduous trees, in spring and summer and to a degree in autumn, there are some things you can't see. In winter, the man-made environment becomes much more obvious because the leaves are off the trees and the sky seems huge. Um, Experiencing all that through a year makes you think differently about how you're going to paint something. But also with painting, I like being able to select the features in uh, a, a landscape or a scene um, or a compilation work where the things inspire me and I enjoy them. Um, it's, it's a little like playing God. And, um, you know, there are times when if you find that, that someone's built a particularly ugly building somewhere, you, you can just decide that you're going to leave it out and select something else to put there. So it, it can work better for a composition, uh, but, but it, it can also help you reflect on what you're really enjoying in creating an artwork. So in this case, you can see that I'm totally obsessed by trees, uh, so many different shapes and colours down there. And... Uh, the, the dear little cottages that are there are actually real cottages, but I've slightly relocated them so that, that I could include them in the composition without them well overwhelming the composition. Yeah, um, we've uh, yeah, spoken previously um, about the fact that you've travelled quite extensively and that influences your work. Um, and yeah, all the different places that you visited come through in, in your paintings and your uh, <laughs> other works. Um, here we actually have an image of you painting on plein air in Antarctica, of all places. Um, could you tell us about your experiences while you were there? Oh, wow. I, I could go on for hours, so you just have to shut me up if I'm um, you know, rambling on for too long. It was one of the experiences of a lifetime, Miriam. Um, I've always been fascinated by parts of the world I haven't been to, and that will continue. But when I was 16, uh, sitting at school, having a discussion with your very knowledgeable 16-year-old friends at lunch, and we were talking about the things we knew we needed to do before we died, which, of course, is what every 16-year-old knows all about, right? Maybe not. Uh, anyway, I, I had decided I wanted to go to Antarctica, and uh, a new arrival at school, absolutely lovely lady, uh, who was also 16 at that point, she said, oh, I want to go too why don't we go together? So a friendship was born and a resolve to go to Antarctica was born. And many, many years later, because it's not a cheap endeavour, um, we got to go. And we selected uh, a very mm, uncommercial, probably isn't the right word, but probably low key Antarctic trip to do. It was an expedition trip. We were in a, a boat, an old Russian research vessel, so there was absolutely nothing luxurious about it. Uh, it was also very expensive to get there, so she scored the bedroom, uh, and I used to sleep on the day bed outside, but at least I had a table next to me so I could paint late at night. Um, 
The great joy, though, was painting on plein air, uh, which the expedition leaders were so excited to see because they'd seen very few people actually do it. We were very lucky. We had amazing weather. Uh, that, that shot of me there looking particularly not elegant, um, it was, I think it was a six-degree day in the middle of the day when I was painting penguins. And um, the lovely thing about wildlife in Antarctica is that it's not frightened of you because since the Antarctic Treaty signing in 1967, nobody's hunted anything down there on the mainland or on the uh, sub-Antarctic islands. So penguins would walk up to me, have a little bit of a look, maybe just flip me with a flipper, not that they were being aggressive, they just possibly wanted to find out what sort of strange penguin I was, um, and then amble off. And um, wildlife would just sit there and allow you to be very close to it and paint or come close to you so that you can paint it. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. And uh, the thing that everybody thinks about Antarctica is, oh, it's all white. It's not. There are so many colours and we were down there when it was, um, you know, the land of the midnight sun, really. You know, the sun didn't properly set until I think it was about midnight for one minute and then it would pop up again. So you'd have these amazing colours across the landscape, but also the Antarctic Peninsula, which is, and I'm on one of the islands in that shot just um, off the peninsula, it's rocky, it's volcanic, it's fascinating. So it has landforms that, that really were just beautiful to paint as well. So I was just incredibly lucky. But you've got to be really prepared. You need to take your gear. Um, I think at that point I'd shared probably about six layers. Um, it's a waterproof backpack underneath me there. So that's why the old red one didn't go to Antarctica. It wasn't going to cut it. Um, you end up with all sorts of, of weird concessions to the weather as well. Uh, in terms of your, of your kit and what you're wearing and, and, and how you move around. Yeah, so, yeah, you've just mentioned, yeah, the cold climate and uh, you had to alter your behaviour, you know, to suit the, the climate. Um, I was wondering, um, did the, that climate impact the way you approached painting um, or your use of certain uh, materials? Sure did. Uh, some of it I, I had a little bit of advance warning about so I could prepare for it and uh, some other aspects of it I really hadn't considered. So you can see me there working with gloves. That's, that's a couple of layers of gloves and, and I was very aware that things like hands and feet get very cold when you're not moving around a lot and you're sitting on the ice. So I um, basically harassed all of those lovely outdoor, um, you know, hiking equipment, camping places until they came up with solutions for me that would allow me to use my hands uh, without being too clumsy, but also keep me warm. So um, I'm a great lover of alpaca gloves. They're really, really soft and you can move your fingers and, um, and grab a brush without going too numb. So several layers of gloves, lots of layers of socks, uh, beanie, obviously that sort of thing, glasses that are Polaroid and aren't going to blow off anytime soon because if you lose them, um, you know, over the edge of, of the ice, you're not going to find them again. Um, so that's that's the stuff I knew about. Um, some of the stuff I hadn't considered, uh, the, the most obvious one was that I was uh, often working in water-based media. Now, that's terrific, but uh, water freezes at zero degrees um, if it hasn't got something in it. So I was, was discussing this issue because a couple of times I had my brush going quite stiff and clumpy and it was because the water was freezing on it with the watercolour in it. Uh, so I was discussing this issue with some of the Canadian expedition people on the boat and given that a few of them were keen amateur artists as well, they were able to give me some really good tips. Probably the best one that I got was paint with vodka. Um, it sounds bizarre, but it, it really, really worked. So I exper experimented with concentrations of vodka in my painting water until I settled on about 30% vodka in my mixing water to mix colours and um, a, a probably fairly similar concentration when I needed to clean brushes. So, uh, yeah, the vodka was fabulous and it didn't influence the paint colours too much, whereas if you painted with pure vodka, I found that it did uh, alter the, the way that the watercolour performed quite a bit. Um, so the, they were the most obvious ones. A um, couple of other things, oil pastels when you're below zero will last forever because they don't do that melting thing that they do in the Greek islands um, mm -hmm. and they, they put themselves out very sparingly onto nice gravelly paper. So some of the paper that I used down in Antarctica I took down as an experiment 
And some of the really gravelly paper with lots of pits in it, I found was really useful because it'll concentrate the colour and allow it to sit there for quite some time. So with your longer drying time, it makes it so much easier when you've got gravelly paper rather than really smooth paper. So yeah, I learned quite a bit down there. Um, you know, another thing to learn also is to make sure that uh, you don't ever confuse when you're painting on the boat and everybody else is having cocktails at night. You don't ever confuse your cocktail glass with your water for painting glass. I've done that. It's not pretty. <laughs> Well, that's one way to find out. <laughs> um, um, yeah, you mentioned a little bit earlier about yeah, your interactions with Thumps and the wildlife in Antarctica and the penguins, and, yeah, you actually have quite a few works uh, with penguins, like these ones here. Um, yeah, do you, do you find that they were particularly um, inspiring or joyful um, subject matter? Oh, absolutely. Um, I had to include a, a penguin piece of art in this exhibition for that reason. They, they've always fascinated me because I find them just so endearing. They're incredibly clumsy on land and they are wizards under the water and, and on the water. It's just such a joy watching them go about being penguins. They're, they're just delightful. Uh, they also happen to be really, really good models because after they've been swimming in all that freezing cold water for hours, they come out hot, would you believe? And so they'll stand there for ages with their wings, uh, fl their flippers kind of out, and you can tell that they're hot because underneath their flippers where, where it's usually a sort of pale, almost white, it's often a quite a bright pink when they first come out of the water, and that means they're hot. So they will stand there like the little guys on the left-hand side, the Gen 2 penguins, um, for hours. And, and it's, it's like there's this conversation going on between them, but, but they're like... Um, you know, people at a cafe, they're in no rush to go anywhere and there's this interaction going on, but they're all pretty chilled in their own sort of particular area, just like people are in their own cafe tables. They're, they're just delightful. And um, when, when you see them on land, um, and, um, you know, ap apologies to any of our uh, more senior citizen men who are listening at the moment, but they remind me of endearing little old men because they, they get this lovely waddle up and they face plant. You know, we don't, we don't think of animals having accidents, but penguins have accidents all the time. And they manage to pick themselves up out of a hole or whatever it is they've just fallen off. And just like the little guy on the right there, they sort of look around as if to say, what was that? Uh, they, you know, they make you laugh. They're so much fun. Um, yeah, we actually have a few more uh, images here of penguins. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I've noticed that, uh, yeah, the image on the right, um, it has a different sense of materiality. Um, you use a range of different materials in your work, um, such as acrylic, watercolour, gouache and collage. Um, do you have a, have a, sorry, do you have a preferred medium? Oh, tough question. Um, depending on what day of the week it is, where I'm painting, whether it's indoors or outdoors and what my mood is, I'll have a different favourite. Uh, I'm an artist who gets very easily inspired by where I am and what I happen to have at the time. But I also get quite easily bored. So I do like chopping and changing and I love experimenting. Um, probably, I mean, mixed media would be the way I describe myself as an artist, a mixed media artist. I, I love the, the serendipity of finding something that works with something else. Uh, putting things together. I, I love collage. Um, one, one of my heroes, which also go back, goes back to my time as a, as a teacher, both as an art teacher, but also as a uh, teacher of young children in classrooms. Um, one of my heroes was Eric Carl, who did the Very Hungry Caterpillar and all those beautiful collage images. And he really influenced my work and so did the kids I taught. Uh, so uh, collage is often part of my work. And I'll very frequently put things together. Also depends on the substrate, what you're working on. So the image on the right-hand side is very, very heavy watercolour paper. And it could take all sorts of punishments. So there's, there's pieces of paper under there stuck on. There's tiny glass beads put on with um, acrylic medium, which sticks them onto the paper to give you a lovely feeling of sort of gravel. Uh, there's acrylic in there. There's oil pastel as well. And I, and I love the interplay of different media together and the accidents that they create that you then have to respond to. I'm, I'm not very good at, at wanting to know what happens at the end of my work. I'd, I'd rather it kind of evolves as I go along. So mixed media does suit me well. 
Um, the penguins on the left-hand side were an epic fail, uh, not from the point of view of the artwork, because I actually started it out as a study in soft chalk pastel, and I was absolutely thrilled with it. I, I got that bond between mother and baby penguin, I felt. The only problem was that I'd done it as a quick study um, to remind myself of what penguins looked like when I was back in Australia, and I did it on butcher's paper. I had about 10 people contacting me, wanting me to buy it, but in all conscience, I couldn't sell it to them because it was on non-archival paper and it wasn't going to last the distance. So I, I had to say, I'm sorry, I can't. So, you know, sometimes it's circumstances that will dictate something. Other times it's a, a preference because of the subject. Um, and other times it's just because. <laughs> Well, yeah, but I think that's kind of the nature of art. It's constantly evolving and you have to adapt for different circumstances. So, um, yeah, and obviously because, yeah, you travel so much and that obviously will also impact how you have to approach things. Um, and, yeah, yeah, speaking, you know, of your travels and everything, um, we've got another image here. <laughs> um, yeah, this is um, another special memory from your travels. Um <laughs> Yeah, clearly, um, yeah, your memories and your travelling you know, has a significant impact on your work. Um, and this is well, was probably initially more of a scary memory, but it's turned into a joyful uh, memory for you um, from when you were in Scotland. Um, yeah, could you tell us more about this? <laughs> <laughs> you forgive me laughing about this. This is one of the reasons that I paint. Um, often it's to relive a memory or, or to reconnect myself emotionally to a place. Um, this was the last painting that I did before my elder son was born. Um, so it's in the family collection. I'd be in big trouble if I ever sold this one. Um, his name is Harry Harry, uh, not my son, the little chap in the painting. Um, many years ago, I was hiking and camping in Scotland as an impecunious student, not much money, travelling with a, uh, a fellow Canadian and she didn't have much money either. Um, so we were, we were both students together travelling around on a shoestring, pitching a tent when it was nice weather, which can be a bit dodgy in Scotland, or uh, finding youth hostels and that sort of thing to stay in. This particular night we were just out of um, the Loch Ness um, sort of vicinity in a, in a little village called Drumna Drocket and um, it's it's pretty much where, where Ness is and um, we couldn't find um, a youth hostel or anything like that this is back in the days before internet and we asked in the lo local pub after the ubiquitous couple of pints if there was somewhere we could stay a lovely lady wearing a tea cosy on her head I could tell because it had a couple of holes and a pom-pom um, and gum boots, uh, you know, in a broad Scots accent said, you know, yes, you can stay in my puddock. And so we decided we'd, we'd pitch the tent in her puddock and um, followed her home, possibly weaving our way down the road a little. Um, Scottish beer is pretty strong stuff for an Australian, you know, little person. Anyway, we, we pitched the tent, didn't think any more about it. She smiled sweetly and said goodbye, and we promptly went to sleep. Uh, right about the middle of the night, the tent started moving around and there was this trampling and there was obviously something very wild and scary outside. We probably told each other a few too many Loch Ness stories as well. Um, the, the tent was under attack. Um, I managed to crawl out through the tent and saw this massive black thing, absolutely terrifying. And I couldn't work out what was going on, but it was pretty clearly tangled up in the tent. I got my Canadian friend out. Um, she was catatonic with fear at that point, even though she was about twice my height. And um, anyway, the, the scary black thing promptly nicked off with our tent. It dragged it away. So... I very quietly and carefully followed it. It was fairly obvious it was wild stock, of, a livestock of some sort. And it eventually had dropped the tent and I, I managed to haul it back to where some of our possessions were and we put the tent up and went to sleep. Anyway, the next morning, I poked my head out to find out what the scary thing was that had attacked us. In the far corner of the paddock was this tiny little shoulder height highland bull with massive horns but he was absolutely tiny he was only you know a meter meter 20 meter 30 tall um and he was just happily being fed hay by hand by his owner who of course was the lady in the tea cozy and the gum boots um so that was the story of harry harry and and years after that experience um my sister-in-law gave me some photos and so, said didn't you have an experience with a highland cow 
And using those photos and my memory of the scene, that's how I got around to painting Hairy Harry. Uh, that's such a yeah such a great story I mean yeah obviously quite probably quite frightening at the time but um yeah now it's just become one of those classics that you know you can share with people and yeah created this really amazing artwork so um yeah and yeah joyful memories of yeah this continuing theme in your exhibition um and yeah you actually have a series of still lifes um on display at the moment at the incinerator um, and yeah, these are reminiscent of your joyful experiences too. Um, could you explain uh, how these flower still lifes are a reflection of joy? Yeah, it, it's um, it's something that doesn't immediately leap to mind. And, and I know when people come to the show, they all say, wow, the work's so different, both in terms of subject and, and in terms of, of media and technique. Um, in, in this case, um, my series of still life, which I did during lockdown recently, uh, was partially a response to COVID, but also as a memory of some really special things that I'd done. And in this case, serendipity, um, I'd, I'd done an artist residency in rural Provence. <laughs> Uh, and I, at the time, I was there for six weeks and every morning I'd take myself for a walk by the canals and find different things to paint. And I'd also find wildflowers and sometimes things in hedgerows. Um, you can see there's some cotoneaster berries there and that sort of thing, which we tend to think of as weed here. Um, lavender, various other things. And I'd just pick them and bring them back. And this still life is is not just about flowers and a few things in a fruit bowl this still life for me actually distills those beautiful experiences of all those walks and painting this which i did have to do from a photograph uh and and from previous paintings of that same bunch as well um painting painting this just really reconnected me to those joyful walks and that amazing scenery and and also encounters um, you can see that there's a um, there's an heirloom tomato there and some figs and um, and grapes. I'm just telling you what the blobs are in case you can't work them out. Um, they were from farmers markets. We'd go to the produce markets uh, at least a couple of times a week to buy everything for um, the artists and our hosts to be eating. And you'd be really lucky with what you could find sometimes. And uh, the food was absolutely beautiful. You know, all grown fresh in the Provencal sun. And um, so that's another part of serendipity too. And I really enjoyed painting those things because, again, it would take me back to the markets and those lovely encounters with gruff Provencal farmers who found it fascinating that an Australian artist was here in Provence but could also speak French and ask too many questions um, and bargained, all those things. So, yeah, that they're, all the still lifes are very significant to me because they take me back to really joyful experiences but also painting them was a lovely experience as well because I was locked down in COVID. I wasn't allowed to sit in, in um, parks or anything like that and paint. So, so this was a way of reconnecting with nature in some way, shape or form and painting at the same time. Yeah, but that's really beautiful. And I think that's something that, um, yeah, people can kind of relate to at the moment, you know, being stuck in lockdown and this sense, you know, light, colour, joy, what your exhibition is all about is something that um, I think people really need. <laughs> right now um and yeah like i said that really comes through in this exhibition so i definitely recommend people go see it if they can um yeah that uh, concludes um the interview portion of this um and yeah thank you so much kathy um for giving us an insight into you and to your work um i'll just yeah i'll stop scare screen sharing now um and yeah i'll we'll have a little bit of time left so yeah we'll move on to some questions so if we have any um oh here we go Okay. Um, yes, someone wants to, wants to know, uh, what continent have you not been to paint? <laughs> <laughs> what a good question. Um, the one I haven't been to is probably an odd one, given that I have been to Antarctica. I haven't been to Africa yet. Uh, and, and I am really, really desperate to get there one day. So, um, you know, roll on us all becoming immune to COVID somehow. Uh, and, um, you know, the whole situation with travel being able to change. Um, I, you know, my partner was born in South Africa and um, I, I, not just for that reason, but also because it's a, a land of just so much fabulous stuff uh, and, and culture. I just can't wait to get there, but I'll have to wait. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, but hopefully soon. 
yeah, international borders will open up and we can start moving around again. Oh, yes, please. I'm desperate to get on a plane. I'm, I'm excited about <laughs> the idea of being strapped into a tin can for 24 hours. Going oh, really? <laughs> That's always the worst part. <laughs> yeah, but if it gets me somewhere, I'm prepared to put up with it this time. Fair enough. Okay. Well, the next question. Um, so have you ever thought about writing a book or an ebook? Um, I would buy this um, as stories, as your stories are so interesting. <laughs> oh, thank you to that lovely person. Um, strangely enough, my progression as a professional artist started with writing books for children. Um, I'd, I'd taught children for many years, always had an art practice on the side, but uh, coming from very solid, you know, working parent sort of stock, it was, it was it, I never considered it as, as a potential profession. Um, writing was something that I seemed to be a little bit better at. And um, uh, at, at one point I took a, a bit of a break from teaching to write, but I found that the whole process of writing, while it was fun doing it, the whole thing about contacting publishers, waiting for revisions, uh, the rejections aren't great either, uh, but the, the lack of um, your own ability to drive your own ship, if you like, um, you know, to, to send things your way when you're working in writing, I found quite frustrating. So what I used to do as a, a way of um, staying sane, really, and also seeing people, because writing can be very solitary, um, so can painting, um, I'd, I'd go and do an art class or two here or there just to keep my hand in, because when I wasn't working with the children, I wasn't doing a lot of artwork myself. So I was missing it. Anyway, that's the painting started selling off the walls, and, and I've been painting ever since. So um, I'll get back to the writing one day. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I might even end up illustrating um, illustrating things myself. But, again, that's repetitive and I'm easily bored. So, um, yeah, we, we might have to stick to the writing and get a professional illustrator to help me out. <laughs> well, if you do decide to write a book one day, clearly you've got an audience already. So, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, kind people. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, next question. Um, what period or style of art has been your biggest influence and who do you draw inspiration from? <clears throat> oh, you have so many different mediums, uh, compositions, etc. stylistically, so assume this has also changed as your work has changed over time. Wow, what a great question. Thank you to the person who asked that one. Um, I've, I've got some heroes, some absolute heroes who hugely influenced my work. Uh, Early on, I was absolutely fascinated, as, as so many people are, by um, everybody from the Dutch masters uh, with their fabulous, almost super real, hyper real still life work and, and their interiors. Uh, I was fascinated by them. I was fascinated by um, Rubens. It's, it's also really lovely to see, you know, the way the female form can be depicted in so many different ways as well. Um, my real heroes, though, as I progressed through my art education at school, uh, which was a fabulous education, thank you, Miss Pringle, if you're out there, um, my real heroes were the 19th century artists, the Impressionists, the Expressionists, and my two art gods, if you like, are Van Gogh and Matisse. And um, also Eric Carl, the illustrator and, and author, he's in there as well. They'd probably be my big three. Um, Eric Carl's work was so joyful. So was Matisse's. And, of course, they both used collage and, and really strong colour. And um, Van Gogh, I would love to meet him at a dinner party and I'd love to be able to tell him, you know, what a difference he's made to our lives, you know, either because people love his work or because people like me are so endlessly inspired by him and how he depicted everyday life, what he did with landscape, how he used colour. You know, they're probably my big ones. Yeah. But um, I think it would be interesting to see, you know, like because obviously Van Gogh, you know, wasn't, um, yeah, didn't sell paintings during his lifetime and everything. So it would be interesting to see, you know, if we could bring him back and just show him the influence, the impact that his work has had um, since since he died, unfortunately. Um, yeah, that would be pretty cool, I think. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, you know, he and 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 a bunch of the French artists, um, they they really liberated colour from what people perceive as as colour. You know, colour became something that could express something of itself. Uh, and for me, colour expresses emotion. You know, I, I use colour 
to help express how I feel about things. And, and uh, uh, you know, the, the art teacher who was after the legendary Miss Pringle, uh, she once told me that I couldn't paint trees blue. Um, Van Gogh did. And I've been painting trees blue ever since. So thank you, unknown lady. You actually, you know, made me get a little bit moxie about that one. And, and um, I've, I've liberated colour thoroughly, um, partially influenced by those artists. But also when you're told you can't do something, you often decide you're going to. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> oh, we've got one more question. Um, of all the amazing artworks you've done, do you have a favourite piece? Oh, that's a really tough one. Ah, um, I, I, I've had some favourite pieces when I've been doing them because they sometimes they've just been such a joyful process in themselves. Um, artworks can be a bit like bringing up children. You know, sometimes they're delightful and then other times you have to work really hard to like them even though you always love them uh, so at times I sometimes don't love an artwork that I'm working on but sometimes the end result will be just something that I'm so pleased with uh, strangely enough many years later I'm really enjoying being reunited with my HSC major work um, it's been in the gallery for a few days now and what I felt and what it gave me when I was making it um, was so significant in my life. So at the moment, it's one of my favourites. Um, and, and one of my other favourites, strangely enough, is also in the show this time, and it's the, um, the um, autumn fantasy from the Highlands, just above my house. Um, and I put a bunch of things in it that, that give me joy as well. Um, you, you know, there are ducks that are totally oversized. You know, they'd be about the size of, of um, you know, your average greyhound, really, the way I've done them in the painting. It gives me great joy as well because it's just so bright and it, and it connects me again with an environment that I'm just loving being in and, and I love watching the transformation. And also being part of the community is really good fun too. So, yeah, th those two at the moment in this show anyway are my highlights, uh, my favourites. But if you ask me next week, I'd probably say something different. <laughs> oh, well, maybe we'll, yeah, we'll do another session next week maybe and, yeah, we'll see, see how you're feeling. <laughs> yeah, we'll see what I say next week. <laughs> and it'll be interesting to see what, what other people respond to. It's... um. Yeah, thank you to Willoughby Council for, for providing this space. It's the second time I've exhibited here and it's a joy to exhibit in it. It's this lovely historic old building, um, once upon a time a garbage incinerator, and it's just been repurposed so beautifully. And I'm enjoying having my artwork in it. But the other thing I'm enjoying is seeing real-life humans. And um, thank you to you real-life humans who are out there, and, and I, I know you're still, um, you know, out there even though I can't see your faces. It's, it's been really a pleasure. But, but seeing real humans in the gallery is just a delight and, and people stopping and staying and chatting. And, and uh, after months of lockdown, I think that's a really nice thing for all of us. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Um... Think, yeah, that's all the questions from the audience and yeah we're getting close to um the end of the session so i think i'll just um i'll wrap up now um but yeah thank you everyone for, for joining us today um i hope you enjoyed it um and learned something new um and thank you especially to kathy uh, for being a part of this um and yeah i definitely encourage everyone to visit the incinerator art space if you can um you have until the 7th of november to see her show um and there's nothing like seeing these works in person so if you can please come <laughs> um yeah, um, yes. Also, if you've got a little bit of extra time, um, I would also recommend uh, paying a visit to Artspace on the Concourse, uh, where the Association of Korean Visual Artists in Australia is currently showing a group exhibition called Here and There 21, uh, which features paintings from both real life and from emotionally influenced memories and recollections of Korea. Uh, so, yeah, uh, before we go, um, I'll just let you know that uh, we will be resending, we will be sending you um, this. Uh, recording in a follow-up email, um, as well as um, a link to subscribe to our monthly e-news um, if you're interested in signing up. Uh, this monthly email um, will keep you up to date on our exhibition program um, and some other art events and opportunities. So yeah, thank you again and we hope to see you all at our art spaces soon and yes, thank you so much Kathy. Oh thanks Miriam and thank you everybody for um, jumping on board. Thank you everyone, see you later. Bye.